Mini Seekers, I'm Nick. I really love these mini PCs. And B-Link reached out, they're like, hey, do you want to check out one of our new mini PCs, the SER4? And I was like, what are the specs like? And then they said, it's got the Ryzen 7 4800U. You had me at an eight core. Let's take a closer look. The reason why I love mini PCs like this is because of the form factor. These are absolutely tiny little PCs that pack in a lot of features. And this one in particular features the Ryzen 7 4800U. This one boosts up to around 4.2 gigahertz. And that's kind of crazy given the size of this little computer. It's an impressive bit of kit, but these come in a few different configurations. This one here is the top of the line one. So this has got the 4800U. It's also got 32 gigs of RAM and a 500 gig M.2 NVMe drive in here as well. In the box at the SER4, you get the power adapter, which is a 19 volt, three amp, 57 watt power supply. You obviously get the SER4 itself. You get a user manual that's in a bunch of different languages. You get Two HDMI cables, you get a short one. So if you're wanting to VESA mount it, you get a normal one if you want to plug it into a normal monitor. And then lastly, you get the VESA mounting plate, which attaches to the back of the unit with these two mounting points. It's pretty easy to get into. It's got four screws on the back side, which I'm going to do this with you guys so you can see exactly how easy it is to get in. I wish I was better at this. After all these years of doing this stuff, you'd think that I would be better. We need to flip the panel this way, right? Because it's got an SSD or a hard disk bay for 2.5 inch drive for SATA drive on the bottom here. Now I'll quickly show you how this works just before we, we dive in. Basically, you just get yourself a 2.5 inch drive and you slide it in. And now you've got a drive plugged in. It's actually very, very cool. And you don't need to use any screws. You can use them if you want, but you don't have to. And basically you just slot it in and then your drive lives inside. Getting it out, you just give it a bit of a wiggle and you can slide it back out and Bob's your uncle. All right, I'm not gonna fully tear down this mini PC, but I'm just gonna show you guys what is upgradable and how easy it is to get to stuff. So obviously it's got two sodium RAM slots here for a maximum capacity of 64 gigs of memory. This has got 32 gigs of crucial memory at 3200 mega transfer. So you can see here that, yeah, there's only two slots. This also has an Intel SSD. This is an NVMe M.2 drive. It's a 512 gig one. This is the 660p. If you were going to go down the path of upgrading, this stuff is really easy to do. So I'm just gonna pull out the M.2 here. So we can just have a bit of a look at this. Single screw, pop the drive out, Bob's your uncle. It's a standard 2280 size slot. So most drives on the market are this size. So you shouldn't have any problems with mounting your M.2 SSD. Underneath the M.2, You'll notice there is the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth card. So this actually features Wi-Fi 6E and Bluetooth 5.2. You can also see the little antenna connectors on the card. They've actually glued them in so they don't pop out if you're swapping out your M.2 drives. As mentioned, it's got two sodium RAM slots. These are very easy. You just push them on each side and the modules will pop out like that. I also just noticed something with this as well. On the hard drive enclosure or the SSD enclosure for the 2.5 inch drives, there's this little bit of residue. And what I realized they've done is on the M.2 drive is they've put a massive thermal pad. Look at the size of this thermal pad, right? And basically they're using this as a heat sink for the drive. That's pretty clever. In terms of connectivity on the SER4, we've got two USB 3.2 ports. We've got a USB type C port on the front. There's also a headphone jack and the power button. And in the corner, there's a sneaky little clear CMOS button. So if you're configuring things and you kind of break something, which is possible. I mean, if you are trying to tweak things, that is, you can clear that CMOS very easily on the front. And on the back panel, we've got some gigabit ethernet, We've got one more USB 3.2 port, a USB 2.0 port, two HDMI 2.0 ports, which only support up to 4K60. 
and obviously the power input. You'll notice there's some vents on the back as well. That's the main exhaust because this does feature a tiny little blower inside of it to exhaust all of the hot air. And I'm gonna come back to that in a little bit and you guys can have a listen to how this thing sounds under load. While we're on the topic of ventilation, you can see that most of the case is mesh. So there's a mesh intake on the top and there's two mesh intakes on the side as well to assist with pulling air in for the blower. The blower is actually on the top of the case here. I didn't really want to fully disassemble this, but I'll show some schematics so you guys can get an understanding of how the rest of the internals of this are laid out. So yeah, you're not missing out on any information here. All right, let's power up the SER4 and take a bit of a look at the BIOS settings, right? All right, you can see here that it's got the Ryzen 7 4800U with the Radeon graphics. It says the base clock for the CPU speed. Also the total memory installed here, which is 32 gigs. Let's take a bit of a look at a few of the things that are already enabled because this actually has Windows 11 Pro pre-installed. So all of the stuff to do with TPM and TPM 2.0 and all the security stuff for Secure Boot is already enabled right out of the box. So the BIOS is actually pretty basic and you wouldn't expect any less from a mini PC like this. But one thing you might wanna do if you're using this for gaming is you'll wanna increase the amount of memory that is allocated to that APU. So the way you actually do this is to go into AMD CBS options, MBIO, and then you wanna go GFX configuration. Usually it'll be set to auto, which is not what you want. You wanna set it to UMA specified, and then you can increase the frame buffer. Now I just gave this eight gigs because this thing's got 32 gigs of RAM, so why not? It's probably a bit too much, but we're actually not losing any real performance by giving it this much memory anyway. So this is just an example of something that you need to consider if you are using this for gaming is changing that setting. So you can go all the way from 64 megs up to 16 gigs and usually it is set to auto. And from what I've seen, when I pre-tested this without actually changing this, it was set to 512 megs. So yeah, you might wanna look at increasing that just from the get-go anyway. One thing that's missing from this BIOS that I notice is the ability to change the fan curve at all. Now, some mini PCs that I've used in the past actually do allow you to do this, but this one does not. And again, I'm gonna come back to fan noise a little bit later in the video because yeah, it's definitely something to consider for this mini PC in particular. But as you can see here, there's not really anything too interesting that's going on here, right? It's all the same stuff you would see in any BIOS, so yeah. This is the standard Windows 11 install. I haven't modified anything really other than changing that video memory that I showed previously, but yeah, it's Windows 11 Pro. You can see the amount of CPU cores and threads and whatnot here in Task Manager. I just thought I would share this with you. And you can see what it's like when it's not idling because I'm actually downloading some things in the background. In terms of all of the APU and everything, as I showed previously with the BIOS settings, I did give this eight gigs of RAM. So the AMD Adrenaline drivers will show you how much VRAM you've got assigned as well as Task Manager will actually let you know as well. It's got eight gigs of dedicated memory. And if we check out the actual RAM, it'll say there's about 24 gigs available as well. I've got the Radian overlay in the top right hand corner in this. Now I'm playing Skater XL. I'll quickly show you the settings here. So for the graphic settings, I've got this set to 1080p at low quality and we're averaging around about 40 FPS, which I actually think is quite playable. So, I mean, it's also dependent on the map, but Skater Excel actually kind of doesn't really matter about the map and it's gotta be an optimized map as well. So this is one of the community made maps that is actually part of the base game too. So it, it runs quite well and I think at 1080p, this is pretty playable, but let's drop it to 720p and see if we can get a couple extra frames here. Let me just get that front nose grind. 
720p doesn't look actually too terrible. It's a bit soft because the quality is at a low setting. We're averaging around 65 FPS here. I wonder what would happen if we just crank up the quality to ultra quality just as a bit of a test. All right, that's not too bad. We actually didn't lose much performance at all cranking this up to the maximum quality setting. So it's probably unnecessary to run this at 720p ultra, but you know, I'm skating so poorly at the moment because I'm playing this through a capture card. So there's a little bit of input lag. <laughs> Let's just blame that, do a hard flip. Well, it's a 360 hard flip, see? A little bit of input lag. Let's go keep flip crooks. No slide, see? A little bit of input lag. Do a beastie frontside flip. Oh, into nose blunt, popped out the wrong way. Let's just go kick flip back 5 0. Nah, see, a little bit of input lag. We'll do kick flip back 5 0. Here, here we go. Kick flip back 5 0. There we go. But that wasn't a back tail. What are you talking about? Another game I've played quite a lot of is Forza Horizon 5. And I think this isn't a terrible experience. Now, I'll quickly show you what settings I've got to get this to run like this. So. We're averaging around 45 to 50 FPS. Let's take a look at the settings here. Now, for the video settings, I've got it set to 1080p. Now, I've actually set all of this to the lowest settings here. So if you take a look at the actual graphical settings, I've set the low preset to everything. Now, I have played with this a little bit and I think that the frame rates that we're achieving here with 1080p low in 1080p, this is quite playable and it doesn't look terrible at low either. Get a little bit of a drift going on here. Ooh, that's how you smash the back window. See if we can get a little bit of a drift going on here in my RS3. I think I've swapped the engine in this one. Ooh, look at that. Oh, I've got to beat j -Way's score here. Look at him. He's completely smashed me on that speed trap. Ooh. I'd be more than happy to play this if it looked like this and performed like this. But here's one thing that I haven't tested yet, right? I haven't tested dropping this down to 720p. So let's take a bit of a look at what type of performance we can expect at 720p. We're seeing like 70, over 70 FPS at the moment, but I'm going to say that around 60 FPS on low is achievable almost all of the time. But take into account that this would be based on where you are on the map as well. So I'm drifting it to get a bit of tire smoke because that will actually drop the FPS. And we're just, yeah, this is running very well. Oh, tried to thread the needle and couldn't do it. There's a few stutters here and there, depending on the assets that are being streamed in. Okay, so Forza Horizon runs relatively well at, I would say, at 1080p low and 720p low, but how does this run with our regular suite of benchmarks? Let's find out. But before we get into all these benchmarks, I wanted to talk about a little program called the AMD APU tuning utility, which allows you to raise the TDP of the chips from 25 watt up to 45 watt. Actually, you can go beyond that, but 45 watt is really what this chip is rated for and what this cooling solution is rated for. So I decided that I wanted to do the thermal testing with both the standard 25 watt mode and the 45 watt mode to show you what the delta between those two modes would be. So let's take a look at the thermals. What you're seeing on your screen right now is the difference between those 25 watt thermals and the 45 watt thermals here. And with the CPU load, which is marked, you can see that it is a lot higher to getting to that thermal throttling level of just 95 degrees. It didn't thermal throttle, but this is right on the border of it being too hot. You'll also notice with the GPU part, so the APU part with the graphics, with that 45 watt mode, the graphics part of the APU gets considerably hotter. We also ran our regular Shadow of the Tomb Raider benchmark that we use for these APUs and whatnot, and you can see that it is 
pretty far behind the 5600G. I mean, you can't really compare them considering one's a desktop part and one's a laptop part. This is about as close as we can get with the hardware that we have available to us. At 720p medium, we're seeing that the 4800U is also faster than the 3550H that we've tested in the past on the Minis Forum DMAF5. You can check out our video with that mini PC in the description down below. And lastly, we've got the 1080p low benchmark. And to be honest, the 4800U actually did perform better than I expected it to in this benchmark. Moving on to Unigen Superposition, we're seeing the 4800U be almost twice as fast as the 3550H. This might be to do with the drivers that we use. They're a lot newer than with our historical data with the 3550H as well. Where this gets interesting is at 720p medium and the 4800U only coming in two frames behind the 5600G. And again at 1080p low in unit and superposition, only two frames behind that 5600G. And there you have it ladies and gents, all the benchmarks that we typically do for these mini PCs and some laptops with APUs and that stuff as well. Admittedly, I did omit Linux testing from this video basically because I've got an idea of another project that I wanna do with this that involves Linux. And I think you guys are gonna find it pretty interesting, but that one is at least three or four weeks away. It's pretty hard to tell at this point in time. But let me know what you think of little mini PCs like the B-Link SER4. We've done a couple of these in the past and I've used heaps of them over the years before YouTube because I used to use them at work for various tasks and I really like them. The other thing is I didn't talk about the price because they have different prices where they start at. I did put the price earlier in the video which for this configuration is 749 US dollars, which is on the high side, but you have to remember this is an eight core 16 threaded CPU. It's got 32 gigs of RAM, and it also has a license for Windows 11 Pro. Now, if B-Link did a version that didn't include an operating system license, I think that could drop the price significantly. So B-Link, if you end up watching this video, make, versions of these mini PCs that don't include operating systems and make it a bit cheaper for people so you don't have to have that license because the truth is I think a lot of people will use a Linux distro with these things as well because everything in here will be supported by Linux out of the box. There's not going to be anything that's not going to work. I'll put links to all the things I mentioned in this video and some relevant information, all that stuff down below. Once again, thank you so very much for watching. I'm your boy Nick with Gear Seekers. You peek. We seek. I love these little computers. They're so powerful and fun. Look at it. It's tiny. That's me making it look like it's big, but it's so small. I could almost fit it in my mouth. I'm out of here. Thanks for watching, guys.